Yes, so thank you for the introduction. Unfortunately, Christian cannot be here. This is why it's now my pleasure to present to you our results about how we design tunable spin interactions using rubric dress tweezer arrays. And let me start with the question, why do we actually need tunable or programmable spin interactions? Well, the goal of this project was to design an experimental platform for analog quantum simulation to study complex quantum many-body phenomena, right? Where, like, one of the biggest challenges remains to keep up the tunability of the system as it is usually restricted to the specific type of implementation, right? And some characteristics of such an analog quantum simulator is, like, for example, that you want to have a um, one-by-one detection method, so you want to detect single particles, you want to observe like uh, spin dynamics, correlations, you want to do real-time um, observations, so you need to be fast, and you might to do, or you might require to even do it in sequence, like doing like feedback, actual feedback. Then meanwhile, you want to preserve the state of your system, right, so you want to have low decoherence, Oops, no, I'm standing right before. <laughs> uh, low decoherence um, to induce um, many body interactions, right? You want to manipulate uh, maybe single particles and then ha add connectivity by um, individually positioning the atoms, right? So, and we want to focus, <laughs> we want to focus on uh, those interactions and the technique that we're actually using is rope progressing. So I will just briefly touch this uh, topic now because Monica was already introducing uh, the basics. However, the basics are super important to understand the mechanisms of the spin dynamics, uh, spin interactions that we are using. All right, as Monica said, we encode our spins in the ground states and then off resonantly excite them to the Rupert state having the Rabi coupling omega and the detuning delta. Right, it's a single atom picture, super boring. Let's move to two atoms. In this case, well, we start with a pair of atoms in the same ground state, and by an effective two photon Rabi coupling, we couple them to the Rubberg manifold. And now you can understand this interaction, as Monica already said, like kind of a, I, well, I used, or I, I used this kind of uh, schematic to show that it's like really like kind of a light shift. Um, that you obtain, and this is like, um, in this case, four photons are involved. This is like indicated by this four in the brackets here. Um, and uh, you can understand this interaction by adiabatically eliminating um, this Rubberg manifold so that you then obtain an interaction that scales with the uh, effective two photon Rabi coupling and the two photon detuning, right? If you want to translate this now into lab terms, into lab parameters, we have to do another additional um, adiabatic elimination. So uh, we we'll have a look at this letter scheme here where we again prepare both of the atoms in the ground state, then we couple them to the singly excited states and then to the Rupert manifold. And as we've, like everyone uh, knows in this, uh, I guess in this room, um, we obtain, due to the Rubberg Rubberg interaction, we obtain like new van der Waals uh, shifted eigenstates, meaning that this two photon detuning then is not only twice a single photon detuning, but uh, an additional van der Waals potential. All right, so if we put all the formulas together and now um, have um, like a look at it in experimental parameters, uh, we obtain something that is well known, right? It's the soft core interaction, as Monica also already mentioned, um, which is also rather intuitively to understand, right? If you put your atoms super close together, your potential is shifted so far away that like no laser can couple to it anymore. So meaning that this interact or this potential needs to saturate at a certain point, uh, which is then described here by the saturation or soft core potential, which scares, uh, scales with omega to the power of four over eight delta cube. All right, so it took like almost like quite a while um, to like for the first realizations of those um, dressed um, interactions. And there were like just, there were a lot of them. Like the first ones were um, in the Biedermann group where they actually used this um, to, to look or generate gates. And um, then there was uh, another um, implementation at the MPQ in Munich 
um, where they actually looked at this type of interaction in an optical lattice. What I actually found out is that both of them, Grant Biedermann and <coughs> Johannes Steyer, um, participated in the workshop like five years ago and were exactly talking about those two results. So now this year, or now, we should like move a little bit beyond like kind of the icing interaction and like have maybe a look at a more kind of general spin model where you have still your kind of standard icing term, also kind of standard flip-flop term, but which is not so standard is this flip-flop term. This you can understand if you talk like in X, Y, Z terms that X and Y are like really different. And the motivation um, for this, um, well, Hamiltonian actually comes from this proposal from 2014 from Alexander Gletzle, um, which was also in one of the last slides from Monica, um, where um, he actually proposed uh, to engineer angular and distance dependent um, couplings. And now, well, the distance dependence, I guess, is rather clear if you work with Rupert Adams. Now the angular dependence now comes in as he's working with Rupert P states. So, and um, here he proposed like kind of an example of an atom array, um, where for example, if um, you look at a certain distance indicated, for example, by this red arrow, um, this corresponds on the plot on the right-hand side to this red dashed line. And um, he actually showed that for various distances, he was able to um, um, generate different interaction uh, ratios, coupling ratios. So um, while well, he proposed to realize like different kind of spin geometries and motivated uh, this to realize frustrated spin systems. All right, so the question is now, how are we now implementing this kind of Hamiltonian in our experimental setup, right? Um, so, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> No, you already saw it. All right, so um, now instead of only using one, a single excitation path, we now add another excitation path, meaning that we have um, now the spin down state, which is coupled via omega down to the rubric state R down, uh, having the detuning delta down, and we have the second spin state, uh, the spin up state, which is coupled the same way. So meaning that we have two excitation paths. And now what sh which is super important to remember throughout the whole talk is that uh, single atom Raman coupling is not possible. So meaning that this red photon here is not coupling to any of those blue states here um, and vice versa. All right, so let's have a look at like kind of how are those um, interactions uh, now occurring. And I will start like with like introducing you to the, to the basics of those interactions and then proceeding with the experiment and then um, we'll show you our exper experimental results, how we actually tune those interactions. All right, so we have now different ground state configurations possible, right? We have, um, for example, a configuration where uh, our pair of atoms, both of them are prepared in spin up state or in the spin down state and all like all the other um, different configurations as well. And now similar as before, we now couple them with an effective two photon Rabi coupling to the Rubik manifold and so on. So meaning that at the end, the interaction should like, look like similar as before. Um, we adiabatically <laughs> eliminate the Rubik manifold The way we use the, uh, do this is like by coupling to the Rubik manifold. So we need to really know well what is going on up there, right? And uh, here you see some um, simulations for those Rubik pair potentials for different distances here in the upper plot. And 
different angles and you see that it looks like way messier than just a simple Van der Waals potential. Right. And also what you, what you also can see here is that those new uh, Van der Waals shifted eigenstates now have a non-zero overlap with the asymptotic Ruberg pair states like R up, R up, and R down, R down, which is indicated by those coefficients here. All right. Um, we're very thankful that we can actually use like open source software packages like Parent Action and Arc, uh, which makes it really uh, straightforward to compute those uh, Parent Action profiles. All right, so let's start with the first interaction with the flop flop interaction where we prepare two atoms in the spin up state, and now via uh, adiabatic elimination of this Ruberg manifold, we want to couple them. Um, both, or we, we want them to perform a um, spin flip. All right, so let's have a look into like more, again, lab parameters. Let's have a look into um, one of those um, excitation legs. Um, we start with both atoms prepared in the spin up state. We couple them to the singly excited state and then couple them to the Rupert manifold. But now, as I already said, like those, we obtain those new Van der Waals shifted um, eigenstates that have like uh, and those coefficients here corresponding to the asymptotic, like the overlap of the asymptotic Rupert pair states, meaning that this the, the Rabi coupling of this upper leg is actually modified by this coefficient, meaning that um, the effective two photon Rabi coupling is then also scaled by this coefficient here. And well, the same thing also happens for the other leg here. And after um, the elimination of this um, upper uh, of the of the Ruberg manifold, we then obtain the flop-flop interaction. And now there are several things that are like super important. So first of all, um, for those interactions to occur, we require Raman resonance. So, but this is like completely different from the single atom Raman resonance I was talking, a uh, Raman coupling I was talking before, right? So this you can understand more or less like kind of an energy conservation which requires to be fulfilled in order to perform uh, this flip, uh, this uh, spin um, change. Then the next thing um, is that actually um, this two photon coupling here, uh, two photon detuning, means that if we're scanning over a Ruberg pair state resonance, the interaction changes its sign. All right, this you will see also later. And then the next thing is actually that in order that this interaction appears, you need a non zero overlap of both those coefficients, right? Meaning if you put the atom super far away, this interaction is zero because either one of them is equal to zero. All right, so then continue, let's continue with the flip-flop interaction. It's rather, rather similar. We have a uh, look at the excitation scheme um, to the Ruberg manifold, like via the singly excited um, state. But now, this time, we have actually two excitation paths possible, meaning that if you choose your detuning correspondingly, you're actually able to vanish flip-flop interactions purely by laser parameters. This is what you also see here in this formula for the effective two-photon Rabi coupling. If you choose your detunings to be similar, um, the same amplitude but opposite sign, uh, the flip-flop interactions vanishes. All right. So this allows us then to like kind of generate of kind of almost well, any uh, interaction ratio, which is shown here uh, in those two um, plots. Those are simulations for different interaction ratios. On the x-axis, you can see the flop-flop interaction over the jz term. On the y-axis, the flip-flop interactions over the jz term. And now those are exactly the same data point, uh, simulation points, um, but each of them carries two informations, carries a positional information and an angular um, information. <coughs> so in this plot here, uh, the color coding actually corresponds to the pair distance. And in this plot here, the color coding corresponds to the angle of the pair with respect to the quantization axis. And you see that we have like a rather smooth um, tuning or tunability in the second and the fourth quadrant. Whereas here in the first and in the third, it looks like more like a scatter plot. 
And the reason for this is that here we're working close to Verberg pair state resonances, which requires a really precise stability of your control uh, parameters. All right, so let's move on to the experiment. Um, now we'll just introduce the basic facts that we actually need to design those interactions. Okay, we're working with tweezers generated by a spatial line modulator. Um, the laser we use has a wavelength of 1064 nanometers, upper power of 40 watts, and then is aligned onto the SLM and um, then focused uh, using our in vacuum built high NA objective, which you can also see on the left hand side. Um, it has a special feature. It has a central hole where you can like almost fit your little finger through um, to also have like kind of an optical access for the mod uh, Z uh, beam here. Then um, for imaging, we use actually a pulsed uh, imaging um, method, pulsed molasses uh, method. And additionally, which is also actually super crucial for those rubber dressing experiments is to have uh, Raman type and cooling implemented, which in our case allows us to reach temperatures of roughly 200 na nano Kelvin. All right, so the second ingredient we need is the rubber excitation setup. And um, this is like fully home built except for um, the Raman amplifier, which is bought. So we started with a home built uh, ECDL laser at 1144 nanometers, which is then amplified and twice frequency doubled so that we end up with one watt at 286 nanometers. And here on the right hand side, you actually see a picture of our uh, second SHC cavity with the crystal right here. All right, so, um, well, and now we actually need two excitation paths, right? And this is where the potassium advantage comes into play because potassium has a rather small ground state splitting of 462 megahertz. So you can use this uh, single photon source, uh, say, yeah, single photon excitation laser setup source um, and split the beam into two paths and uh, put an in, in each path an AOM so you can easily bridge this ground state splitting and have two excitation paths aviable driving uh, transitions from two different ground states to two different Rupert states. So uh, in order to tune those interactions, those distance and angular interactions, we then furthermore prepare different tweezer arrays. Those tweezer arrays consist of groups of three tweezers and those groups we just repeat along the quantization axis to get more statistics and they're spaced so far away so that they don't interact with each other. And now using the special light modulator, we can actually uh, tune the different angles of those uh, groups with respect to our magnetic field, which defines the quantization axis, and uh, also the different spacings between um, the tweezers. All right, so the only ingredient which is now missing is um, how are we actually measuring um, this, like, so how are we detecting our spin interactions, right? So um, the way we do it is um, we start with, well, in like kind of statistically loading our tweezers. So we have like different initial loading configurations. Like either we have a fully loaded group um, or for example, we have like um, a group where two out of three tweezers are loaded at nearest neighbor position. So those are the configurations um, of interest. And then we prepare them all in the same spin state, which is in our case a spin up state. We uh, perform some Rydberg dressing pulse, and then afterwards heat out all the atoms that are in the spin up state. Meaning that if no interactions occurred, we just don't recapture any atoms in the second picture, they're all just gone, right? But if interactions happens, for example, in this case where two atoms are loaded, um, we actually might recapture the same atoms, the same atoms with a second picture. This is what we then see here. And now there is, well, this is the same case also for in the case we have a fully loaded group, right? But additionally, like if there is a situation that we have flop-flop and flip-flop interactions present at the same time, this leads to a recapture of the outer two atoms. And this is how we trace back the flip-flop interactions later. All right, so we are now, we're now all set. Let's actually check whether we can tune the interactions. Or let's tune the interactions for 
the, let's say, rather simple setting. We choose the tuning, uh, which is somatic, right? We don't expect any flip-flop interactions to occur. And now we don't want to cross any Ruburg pair state resonances to really make sure um, to have like kind of the cleanest system. So we scan along this x-axis here, um, prepare our atoms at an angle of 90 degrees and prepare them at different distances to each other. And this is actually, whoops, what you see here in this plot. So indeed our data points nicely reveal um, the, inter the expected interaction shape. And in the next scan, we actually want to um, tune also the angles of the interactions, right? So we prepare them as, at a fixed distance and now vary the angle um, of the trees or groups. And this is what you see here on the right-hand side. And indeed, we see an increased flop-flop probability um, around those group of pair state resonances. But now we also want to switch on flip-flop interaction. So we choose now a different uh, laser detuning, which also allows for flip-flop interactions to appear. So let's start again with the flip-flop. Um, we scan along now at 50 degrees and tune the interactions by placing the atoms at different distances with res uh, respect to each other. And <laughs> this is what you see here. Um, and indeed, our data nicely also follows this interaction uh, shape where, where we expect it to be. Uh, and the same also for the angular scan. So we scan along this uh, axis here um, and also see a, uh, that the data uh, nicely follows um, the expected interaction with an interesting feature, which is like uh, this uh, vanishing of the interaction. And this is now, well, this come, well, this you can understand as like in order to obtain those uh, flop-flop uh, interactions, you're summing over all those van der Waals shifted eigenstates, right? Meaning that actually at this position here, um, they are all kind of destructively interfering, interfering, cancelling the the, fl uh, the flop-flop interaction, which you can see here in this white um, uh, area here in this plot. All right. So, but now we also want to check for flip-flop flip interactions. And we scan again along this uh, axis here, so prepare our atoms at 50 degrees, and uh, we'll uh, vary the distance between them. And indeed, we also see an increased flip-flop probability around the rubber pair state resonances where we expect it to be. And then before we switched off the flip-flop uh, flip interaction by simply choosing a corresponding laser detuning, right? But now we also wanted to check, like, can we switch it off by a geometric arrangement of the atoms? So this is the reason why we were scanning here for the flop-flop interactions uh, where they appear. But in this case, we don't expect any flip-flop interactions, right? And this is also what we see here, that basically there is no flip-flop interaction present. All right, but there's something off here. This is like very unfortunate. It's like this rather low probability of those flop-flop interactions to occur, right? So we're completely not in the coherent regime. So why is this so? What limits us from seeing those coherent interactions? Well, there are two major reasons and several others as well. One major reason is actually the phase noise of our excitation laser, which you can understand of like if you go detuned from resonance, you have like uh, incoherent resonant excitations due to your phase noise of, of the excitation laser. And this is actually what we measured here in this plot. So we kept the Rabi coupling fixed. Um, we changed the detuning from the resonance and we measured the Rupert dress lifetime and um, plotted the ratio between the expected Rupert crest lifetime and the measured measured one. And we see that we actually are like, like a factor of 20 worse. Well, the other problem we had at that time when we took the, the measurement is that we were suffering from tweezer to tweezer inhomogeneities, which were in the order of 10 to 15%. And now you can imagine that this really kills the Raman condition required for the flop-flop interactions, right? 
This is like in the order of 10-ish kilohertz. And what I didn't tell you so far is that during the whole Rydberg dressing pulse, we actually keep the atoms trapped. It kept the atoms trapped, so we kept the trapping light on, but just lowered the overall trap depth to the absolute minimum before gravity pulls open the trap. And then still we had like a different uh, trap depth between neighboring traps of 10, 10 kilohertz. And then there are like still, still some, some matter effects like Doppler shifts, which you could also improve like uh, in terms of uh, improving your cool Raman Saipan cooling and so on and so forth, like the intrapid wave packet size, which well, could also allow for some motion spin entanglement and so on. But all of them are non-fundamental. They're all like individually already kind of solved. So we just have to co combine all those different techniques and um, yeah to overcome those issues and get into the coherent reg uh, regime. And well, with this, let me quickly summarize what I have been talking about. I have, intro have introduced you to those um, <laughs> flop-flop and flip-flop interactions. <laughs> I, have, I have been talking about those workbook pair potentials, which are very crucial in order that those interactions appear. I've shown you those different interaction uh, profiles and how we actually have measured spatially localized kind of uh, interactions. Uh, I briefly was talking about the technical um, limitations that are, as I said, purely technical and non-fundamental yet. All right, with this, let me introduce you to the team that has been working on this project. So there is like, uh, well, Christian for sure, um, Nico and Lorenzo who graduated um, and are not members of the group anymore and there is still Arno, Philip and me and we have some uh, two very smart master students who are also rocking their projects uh, in, in the lab. And with this, thank you for your, whoops, again. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So the, the coupling strengths are on the order of five kilohertz, okay. kind of, yeah. And what, and what is your, uh, what well, we, yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, so there are five kilohertz. So, um, and well, currently like our, like at the regime we're measuring, um, we, <laughs> we have a reduced robot dress lifetime to, which is like um, 70, Seven, well, 100, 100 uh, microseconds, and this is like, well, almost a factor of 20 that we expect, uh, well, not, yeah, unfortunately expect from the theoretical dress lifetime of two milliseconds that we should have. So does that mean if you reduce your laser phase noise by like a factor of 10? Yes, that, that is exactly what we're aiming for, a factor, factor of 10 at least, okay. yeah. Which can be like achieved, like several groups already have achieved, like optical filtering, uh, cavity filtering, uh, to reduce this phase noise. And then, like, but we have like an additional problem, um, kind of, because um, we have to. Well, we have this Raman amplifier, right, which needs to be seeded at any time. So we cannot simply use like the transmission of the of the cavity uh, of the cavity, which is like too few power. Um, what you need to do in addition is like to inject a laser diode, right, um, which is then um, used um, to um, as a seed for the Raman amplifier. So provided that you solve this coherent uh, issue, which kind of models have you looked at um, solving? Uh, so I noticed, for example, the Kitayev model, uh, the, the linear chain is one that requires this block block interaction. So the answer will be like a little bit twofold because this is like really ahead of the like a horizon that like uh, we are like currently working on for sure we would like kind of work with the flop flop uh, term and look like I don't know like yeah, doing like some adiabatic sweeping or so on and so forth in this term or you go to um, quantum metrology do some some sque squeezing with this and so on. 
But to be honest, like we, we first have to solve this issue first before going into this direction, because like if this is not solved, we cannot move further. Um, yeah, so I must say I didn't like directly compare it with uh, this uh, with the okay, measurements yet yeah, directly, but I think like the the, the power of this um, using robot dressing in this case is that like you really can easily prepare uh, your spin states, and you can also easily switch off and on um, your interactions just purely by laser parameters. Fundamentally, I mean, like, other than this, uh, uh, like, this kind of explosions in principle, these things would scale. I mean, the errors you introduce in Bokeh would be similar. No, it would be better. Huh? It would be better. Because, because you have the action strengths compared to the uh, effective action would be better. Sorry, I mean, okay, hold on. So, you are talking about, like, maybe I am confused. Okay, maybe so, 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 so maybe what you, what you are saying. Why, what if you drive resonantly? That's what you what, if, what if you try to go, even if you try to go adiabatically close to resonance back? Yeah. And construct a Hamiltonian by doing this repeatedly? I yeah. think you get more in the action pair spontaneous motion. So you mean similar as Adam's standard or kind of realization? Yeah. I mean, in fact, all the, yeah. all the yeah, tracing papers are close to resonance. No, no, yeah, I mean, yes, it is. Okay, I mean, it is, yeah. So maybe what, uh, what Manuel is trying to. So actually, Okay, actually, theoretically, in principle, it should not, like, I mean, all of the theory proposals, they were all kind of oppressed. But, I mean, I think not what, in, in practice, in practice, what people find out is that, basically, you don't want to spend too much time in rebuck states, you know, and, and for that, you want to get, like, there in and out very quickly, you know, as kind of mm. possible. I mean, mm -hmm. in fact, you know, what Monica is showing is one even one even should do it even quicker, you know, because mm -hmm. of this cascaded case. So yeah, like that's a, maybe I would just add. I think like, you know, there was this concept initially of going sort of far off resonance, yeah. for example, if you're trying to match the time scales of the hopping yeah. in the Hubbard model or something. Yeah. But if you're trying to make a yeah. pure spin model, you do want to work pretty close to resonance, yeah. um, and then exactly how close. You know, might depend now on, this, on the situation, but but like. No, but Peter kind of pointed yeah. this out to me that even the first tracing proposal had that in it actually that you go adiabatically close, yeah. real yeah. resonance adiabatically out repeatedly, yeah. and then it would be better. But I'm not sure anyone really tried that. That's the reason. But you don't do it repeatedly. You don't do it repeatedly. But you don't. You go exactly on resonance. Close, yeah. so it's, it's, it's because you don't want to spend. Basically, you don't want to spend. But actually, maybe I have a, like a kind of every challenge is an opportunity. Can you show this? This your your plot the data uh, again? Is it actually is your method? Is it like to actually to measure the phase noise in practice is accurately is not so easy. Is it kind of can this be viewed as a way to measure the phase noise? So what is exactly? Well, it's well, what is it exactly what you're plotting here? I'm so actually, you like what you actually see is the probability of like having those uh, incoherent um, resonant excitations of your of your phase noises. Of uh, on, uh, of your spin, in your of what state? Probability of what? Of exciting the atoms to the Rupert state. But, but what are you? What are you measuring here? Sorry, what the Rubberg the Rubberg dress lifetime, which scales then with the like the mm -hmm. the admixture, like the theoretical admixture, right? But which is also um, even increased due to this phase noise. And so basically, you would expect that you should somehow scale quadratically. Yes, exactly, exactly. But what you observe? Well, we would, yeah, we would. Well, okay, so we would quadratically expect the dress lifetime. Yeah. But here we plot the ratio between the theoretical dress lifetime and the measured one. So what we expect would to be here at this, like to have an ideal factor of one, which is this blue line here. Yeah. Why do you say it's hard to measure the Well, this 
this phase noise is kind of. Well, yes, but it's something uh, there are always kind of. Spinning off. Actually, we should do this with a bunch of print back later. Just take all the cracks and compare them. Yeah, this is actually more important than the comments. Yeah, sorry. You're talking about measure on atoms. On atoms, yeah. On atoms, yes, yes, exactly. We did with the block consumption. You can go up to omega, so it's super simple. Sort of comment slash question. This is a nice measurement. And I was just going to say what we see is actually worse than what we would naively expect when we just measure the phase noise of our, at least of our seed laser at 1280. Mm -hmm. OK, there's a couple of stages of frequency doubling afterwards. But I also am wondering whether maybe some intensity noise comes in, or it, it's not mm -hmm. obvious to me exactly what sets the rate that we do see with mm -hmm. these. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit so, of effect, so I'm wondering yeah. if you have more insight. Um, so yeah, we have like just recently started like working on a filter cavity setup and like kind of starting to compare those different uh, measurements. But we are not yet there to have like fully understanding to answer your question mm -hmm. there. So yeah. So what you're saying, Monica, is that sometimes actual measurement done like on atoms basically. If the measurement done on the at we yeah, it seems worse than what we would expect if we just measure the phase noise of our light um, before the kind of frequency quit. Yeah. For me at least it's not yeah, it is a little bit kind of a challenge if I don't I mean but yeah. Which would be good to have a reliable map. This measurement is there also connective avalanche loss contributing, or is it only space based? No, this is like the atoms are super spaced I far see. away, they're not interacting like this is like really safe that there is no collective avalanche processes in.